Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Mary. Uh, I'm going to talk about Isla, which is a programming language I've been making for young children. Um, so I'm going to talk about designing a language for children. I'm going to talk about the compiler that I wrote that runs the language. I'm going to talk about teaching my girlfriend and my dad to program. And I'm going to speak about modes of expression. Um, but first, I'll take you through your first program written in Isla code. So Isla is a drummer. Uh, here she is, hopefully. Yep. Um, that's my niece. She's uh, called Isla. Uh, she likes the Yankees. Um, she's two years old. And her favorite lunch is jelly tots, which is a type of English sweetie. Here's some more people. Uh, Mary is a guitarist, and Emma is a singer, and Sophie is a pianist. And here's a list of Isla's aunties. So we'll add Mary to that list, Emma, and Sophie. So let's review. Isla's a drummer. She's two years old. Uh, she loves jelly tots, and she's got three aunties, a guitarist, a singer, and a pianist. So designing a programming language for children. Um, well, first of all, can children program? Um, I feel like at age five, which is the lower bound of the age range I'm aiming at for this language, then at age five, then children can learning to read, learning to write, which me, to me means they can input code at the keyboard and read it off the screen. Um, and they can also reason as well. They've got the faculty of reasoning. So I've had some humiliating defeats at the hands of my niece when um, debating whether she should be allowed to have another jelly tot or so. Um, and then should children program? Well, <sighs> computers are being used to make more and more stuff. And that's only going to increase as time goes on. And also, I think programming is the best way to control a computer. Um, and so. And I think a person makes something to try and show what is inside their head. And I think it's a really good thing for people to show each other the insides of their heads. And so should children program? Well, if computers are being used to make more and more stuff, and programming is the best way to control a computer, then to me, programming is becoming like a core skill, the way we view reading and writing and doing maths at the moment. And so um, I think programming should be learned at the same time as all those skills, i.e. from about age four or five. What are the opinions that I use to guide the development of the language? Well, number one, programming is typing. So um, programming is not clipping together little jigsaw pieces that have code written on them. Um, it's not uh, manipulating blocks with a GUI. Uh, it's not using any kind of GUI. It's, it's, it's typing words into a computer. Um, and the reason this is important is, uh, number one, language is the best way that humans have come up with for expressing ideas in a powerful and subtle way. Um, and number two, there's this notion of indirection, which I, is the reason that I think programming is so fun. So I type in something into the computer here, um, and then something happens over here, and in between there's magic. And that magic is fun. But um, I'll come back to that idea in a bit. Number two, uh, the second opinion I took was that you should have an application for a programming language. It, sh it should be useful for something. So I didn't want um, kids just, or anyone, just typing in random code to instantiate variables or print out the numbers between 1 and 100, because that's really dull. Um, they should be able to make something with it, because that's the whole point of programming to me, is to express yourself, to actually make something. And so the application that I chose to start with was a old school text adventure writing environment. So you can type Isla code and you define your own old school text adventure, you know, kind of like Zork or Adventure or whatever. And then you can play through it so it's interactive. But at the same time, different heads contain different things. So I didn't want to tie the core language to the particular application that I chose, the storytelling environment. And so I've tried to make it general so that it could be conceivably used for anything. And number four, the fourth principle um, that I've used to guide the development is to use baby talk. So what I mean by that is to try and make the language similar to how children actually speak. 
Um, so that, that means there's a few ramifications of that. So number one, there's no punctuation except for the apostrophes that go around strings. Um, and that, that's because uh, punctuation is hard to uh, distinguish. It's hard to distinguish pieces of punctuation from each other. Um, and it's also hard to type punctuation because you often need to use the shift key. Um, number two um, is that ma most programming languages use programming jargon like for or if or while or then. And I mean, what the hell do they mean? So all of the keywords in Isla are, are words that a child would actually use in the context that they're used. And then number three is the language is somewhat natural language-ish. Um, and my aim there is to try and make it so that even if you don't know much code, even if you don't know how to code, you'll be able to read the language and basically read a piece of code and basically understand what's going on. Um, but at the same time, I'm trying to avoid that trap that, say, AppleScript falls into, where it looks like English and it gives you the impression that you can just type any random thing that comes into your head that's in English and it, the computer will magically understand, because, of course, it won't. And so there's only one way to do everything, and it's very consistent. Um, and it's a much closer to a sort of pidgin English. So I'm trying to avoid that impression that you can just type any random stuff that comes into your head. So the Isla compiler, this is the thing that the piece of code that goes from a piece of Isla code like this, so write Isla, to actually printing out Isla at the console. So how do we get from a piece of code to the result? Well, the compiler that I wrote takes a two -stage uh, does a two-stage uh, process. Number one, parsing. Number two, interpreting. So let's start with parsing. Parsing is taking that piece of code, which starts out as a completely unstructured string, so just a list of characters, um, and turning it into a much more detailed recipe called an abstract syntax tree, which can be used to actually run the code. So here is the abstract syntax tree for that piece of code that we just saw a moment ago, write Isla. So this is going to print out Isla to the console, nothing else. So let's go through it. So at the top level, the whole thing's a tree. Then you have an expression. So the whole piece of code is an expression. And then you can subcategorize that expression as an invocation, which means you're running a function. And then that invocation splits down into two components. The identifier, which is the name of the function you want to, to run, write, W-R-I-T-E, and then the parameter, or the value, which is the parameter being passed to the function, which is Isla in quotation marks. And then the value can be subcategorized as a literal as opposed to a variable. And then the literal can be subcategorized as a string as opposed to a number. So this is the end result of parsing. So how do we get there? We, I use something called a parsing expression grammar, or also known as a peg for short. Um, and a parsing expression grammar is a list of rules which basically says, on one side, I've got this thing, and I can decompose it as this list of things here. So let's take an example. Here's one of the parsing expression grammar rules, known as a production rule. And it says that an invocation can be decomposed into an identifier, follow, which is the name of the function you're going to run, right, um, followed by space, followed by a value, which is, the name of the, which is the parameter that you're passing to the function, followed by a new line character. So let's look at the parsing expression grammar for uh, to parse this piece of code. So on the left, we've got the grammar, and on the right, we've got the abstract syntax tree that comes out, which is the end of the parsing stage. So we have to start with an expression. That's what the parsing expression grammar says. OK, let's pop that into the abstract syntax tree. Then the next rule says that an expression must be an invocation. OK, easy. Let's pop that into to the abstract syntax tree. Then the parsing expression grammar says that an invocation must be composed of an identifier followed by a space, followed by a value, followed by a new line character, as we saw a moment ago. So let's take those pieces one at a time. An identifier, the parsing expression grammar says, must be a list of lowercase letters, more than one lowercase letter. So that is right, the name of the function we're trying to run. And then the value, the second part of the invocation, the parsing expression grammar says that that must be a literal. OK, let's pop that in. 
And then the parsing expression grammar says that the literal must be a string. And then it says that a string is an apostrophe followed by zero or more lowercase letters followed by another apostrophe. And so we can pop that into the abstract syntax tree. So we've parsed that piece of code. We've done the first stage of the compilation process. So how does the parse function actually work? Well, we've done the hard work now, because if you're using a parsing expression grammar, you're probably using a parsing expression grammar library. I used one. It's called PEG.js. It's really nice. I highly recommend it. Um, and all you do is you give your list of production rules, your parsing expression grammar, to the library. And then it gives you back a parser. And then you shovel code into your parser, and it gives you back the abstract syntax tree. So the parse function is trivial. Next stage, final stage, is interpreting. So this is taking the recipe that we've produced, the abstract syntax tree, and essentially following the instructions, which means running JavaScript code, in my case, um, that is commensurate with the instructions in the, in the recipe. So here's the abstract syntax tree as JSON. Um, let's look at it in a bit of detail. Line two is the first node, the expression, which is, remember, the overarching node of the whole tree. Um, the tag attribute says that it's of type expression as opposed to an invocation or an identifier or a value or whatever. And then the content is every subnode under it in the tree. So the expression node has a whole of the rest of the tree underneath it. Now, a quick aside, the way the interpret function works is that Essentially, what you want to do is you want to run different code depending on what type of node you're dealing with. So you want to do something different if you're, running an exp if you're dealing with an expression node in the abstract syntax tree to if you're dealing with a string node in the abstract syntax tree. Now, you could do this by uh, uh, defining a bunch of classes and then defining a specific version of the interpret function on each class. And that would totally work, so you'd have a class for an expression node and a class for an identifier node and so forth. That would totally work, but it's a bunch of boilerplate and it's a waste of time. Another technique you can use is multi-methods, which is a functional programming technique where you just define the functions that you care about. So let's look at an example. Again, we're in JavaScript here. Um, I used a library called multi-method.js. It's really nice. Um, so it starts out on line one with instantiating the interpret function which is just a multi-method. Now, the way the multi-method decides which version of itself to run, it decides based upon what the arguments are that are passed into the function. So let's look at an example. So this is the piece of code that decides which version of the multi-method to run. So remember, we've got a version for an expression node and a version for an identifier node and so forth. We need to figure out which type of node we're dealing with. So we just look at the node that gets passed in on line three, look at the tag, which will be a string-like expression or identifier, and return it. So that's the dispatch function. So then this is um, us defining the actual interpret functions that we're going to run. So on line six, in the case of an expression, we do something. On line 10, in the case of an, of an invocation node, we do something else. So let's look at the real interpret function. Same idea. We've got a dispatch function, which tells us which version of the function we want to run. And here's our first customer, line 6, the actual function that we run for an expression node. So it's pretty simple. Line 7, um, we look at the node, grab the content, which, in, remember, in the case of an expression node, is going to be the whole of the rest of the tree, and then just call interpret again, so we recurse, which will result in running this function, the invocation function. So this is the invocation version of the interpret function, and this is where the real stuff happens. So on line two, we need to figure out what the name of the function is we want to run. So we need to figure out write, W-R-I-T-E. How do we do that? Well, it's pretty trivial. We just look at the node on line two, look at the content, and then grab the first element of the content, which is going to be the right identifier, um, and then call interpret on it, which calls this version of the interpret function for an identifier, which just returns the content of the node, which is just going to be the string right. So bingo, line two, we've got our function name. Next, line three, we need to get the actual function we want to run. So I've defined the write function, which just writes out the string you pass it to the console in JavaScript. So we need to go and grab that JavaScript function. How does that happen? Well, what's, what's going on here? Um, we can see something about an environment. Now, the environment is 
the general context that you're running all of your Isla code in. And it includes the actual context, which is where you store all of the variables and functions that are in scope currently. Um, now, that's where the write function belongs, the W-R-I-T-E function. Um, and because that's a built-in, it's a function that's built right into Isla. Um, it's available in, at all times. So we need to go and grab the write function from the execution context. So that we just get the environment, which gets passed into every invocation of the interpret function, get the context off the environment, look up the function name, and bingo, we've got the actual JavaScript function we need to run. On the home stretch now, we just need to grab the parameter, which we're going to pass to the write function, which is just remember it's Isla in apostrophes. That's the thing we're going to print out. So it's the second element of the content of the invocation node. So we call interpret again. That calls the value version of interpret, which same, same pattern. Look at the content, call interpret. That calls the literal version of interpret. Same again. Look at the content, call interpret. Finally, here at last, we've got the actual thing we're looking for. We're, this is the string version of the interpret function. And we look at the content of the node, um, which will just be Isla in apostrophes, um, and pass that back. So now on line four, we've got the parameter we're, we're trying to print out. Then long last, line five, we can actually run the function. So you can see that we just invoke fn and pass in the parameter, and that will print out Isla to the console. Then it returns a return value, which in the case of the write function is uh, undefined. Um, and then finally, a bit of tidying up. Because every, um, every expression can um, modify the environment, we need to return the new environment that resulted from this, from this uh, node being run. Now, in our case, there's no changes, actually. So the context just stays as environment.context, which is what got passed in. And then we specify a return value, because expressions in Isla can return values. But obviously, in this case, it's going to be undefined. So. Uh, that's basically in the end of the code. Um, teaching my girlfriend and my dad to program. This was really fun. Um, I, as I said, the eventual goal for Isla is for it to be usable by five-year-olds, but that's a long way in the future. At the moment, um, as a stepping stone, I'm using non-programmers um, who are non-technical people, and th which includes uh, Ellie and my dad, um, to try the language out on. So. I sat each of them down separately at, a, at an Isla REPL, where you can just type in pieces of Isla code. Um, and we worked through it. So this is Ellie. Um, she typed, write, my name is Ellie, in apostrophes, which of course prints out, my name is Ellie. That was all good, totally worked, understood what was going on. First problem was when I suggested that she write out a number instead. And when she wrote this, she wrote write 26, but she put apostrophes around 26. And I said, that's cool. That totally works. Um, but you don't need the apostrophes. And she said, well, why? And I sort of thought about it and thought, well, that's a good question. Um, and I thought about talking about the historical reasons for why you don't, or the computational reasons why you don't need apostrophes around numbers in many programming languages. But that was far too much detail. And so I asked her a bit more about what she was thinking. And it, it turned out that this apostrophe notion was something that she clung on to to understand what was going on in the code. So to her and my dad, apostrophes meant inert or inactive or literal, whereas no apostrophes meant active, something like a variable or a function name. And so the fact that there were no apostrophes around the number 26 was really confusing, because it seemed like it was going to be active, when actually it was a literal. So I've changed that in the language. And now you have to put apostrophes around every literal. This is my dad now. He's instantiating the name variable and assigning it to Richard. And then he's typing right name. And of course, that prints out Richard. When this happened, it was kind of profound, actually. It was a sort of beautiful moment, because he said, oh, this is fun. And you know, I mean, he'd never done any programming before. He's 67. Um, and uh, it seemed like he understood why it was fun. And that, I think, brings in this idea of indirection again, where, again, as I say, you, you do something here, and something happens over here, and there's magic in between, and that's why it's fun. And so it's kind of like setting up a long line of dominoes all, sat, all stood on their ends, where you flick one, and you watch the whole of the rest of them go. And I think that's why programming's fun. Now, finally, for this section, metaphors. Um, when I was working through 
the co working through teaching Isla to Ellie and my dad, then um, I found myself using metaphors or analogies a lot. Um, so to explain variables, then um, I used metaphors. And I found that they both responded to different types of metaphors. So um, Ellie liked this notion of aliases, where the alias is like the variable name, and then the actual person is the um, piece of data. Whereas my dad preferred this notion of bags, where you've got a bag, and it's got the variable name written on it, and then you put the data in the bag, and that's like a variable. Now, the problem here is that these are awful analogies. That's not the way variables work at all. Um, but I couldn't come up with anything better. And then things got a little worse when I tried to explain references to my dad. So in Isla, you can, let's say you instantiate two objects. Uh, Mary is a person and Isla is a person. And then you say, Mary friend, uh, Isla friend is Mary. So friend, the attribute of Isla, is um, a reference. So I explained this to my dad with this notion of maps, where maps as in treasure maps, not uh, hash maps. Um, and uh, so I said, uh, reference is kind of like a map, where you follow it to its location, and it might produce another, another reference, another map. And then you follow that one to where it goes, and maybe you get the actual piece of data. And that's all good. You know, that worked. He understood what I was talking about. But it took like five minutes, and a proper backwards and forwards conversation, um, and a diagram. And so I'm really unclear on how I'm going to teach this stuff when I'm not there to talk it through with the person being taught. So that's totally an open question at the moment. There's a lot of open questions with Isla, really. Which leads me to modes of expression. Um, final, final topic. Your mode of expression is the medium in which you choose to make the thing you're making. So a mode of expression is as a film, or um, as a novel, or as a piece of prose, or as a poem. Um, and you have to choose your mode of expression extremely carefully, because your mode of expression dictates your abstractions. Now, your abstractions are the building blocks that you use to express your idea. So they're the sort of base materials that you can combine in some interesting way to produce the thing you're trying to make, you know, be it a novel or um, uh, Microsoft Word or whatever. Um, and so as programmers, our abstractions are things like variables or functions or continuations or closures or libraries of code. But the most powerful abstraction that we have um, is the programming language we choose to use. And it's a programming language is kind of a meta abstraction, really. And the reason for this is syntax. Programming languages are really the only way that you can control the syntax that you use. It's the only way you can decide what type of syntax you want to use. And the reason syntax is important is because it allows you to arrange your other abstractions. So you've got your abstractions, and they're all well and good, but you use syntax to um, order them and thus produce what you're making. So to explain what I mean, um, I'm going to talk about freeze frames in film. So the freeze frame has being, been being used for pretty much since feature films um, have, were started being made. Um, and so by freeze frame, I mean the film, the, you know, you're watching a, uh, some, f some film, and the film's moving, and then it stops, and you've got a still image in front of you for a number of seconds. So if you go back to 1947, when Frank Capra made It's a Wonderful Life, then near the beginning of the film, there's a freeze frame of George Bailey, the protagonist, who's played by Jimmy Stewart. And he's talking about the breadth of his ambitions, and he does this gesture like this. But when he's speaking, then he sighed onto the camera, as I am to you. And in this gesture, there's a tiny microcosm of the whole film. So what this idea expresses is that George Bailey has these grand ambitions to build bridges and to see the world. But he, in the end, forsakes them all in, in, in exchange for a life of great depth. So he stays in Bedford Falls, he marries the woman he's in love with, he raises some children, and he builds an altruistic business. So his life is not wide at all, not, not, not wide at all. It's actually very deep. And so Frank Capra expressed a single idea with this freeze frame. Um, it's a quite beautiful and subtle idea, I think. But nonetheless, it's a single idea. Um, if you come forward to 1992, when Martin Scorsese made Goodfellas, then you find freeze frames being used in a far more subtle fashion. Um, so there's freeze frames throughout Goodfellas. Um, 
And what Scorsese uses freeze frames for is as a piece of syntax, as opposed to a piece of vocabulary. And this is the key difference. And the fact that he uses the freeze frame of syntax makes it a far more powerful tool at his disposal. So to give you an example, there's a freeze frame. And he uses that as a piece of syntax to arrange his vocabulary, his building blocks, which are character points of view. So, for example, the, the film freezes, and you've got the narrator speaking, which is one point of view. You've got what the characters were saying before the freeze frame and after the freeze frame, which is two more points of view. And then finally, you've got the actual what's going on in the freeze frame. And see, so he's using the freeze frame to arrange these pieces of vocabulary into a far more complex um, construction. And so Scorsese took the freeze frame much further, and this is why syntax is important. Because more powerful abstractions give you more control over what you build. And abstractions suited to your work give you even more control over what you build. And so to me, there's just an inevitable conclusion here, which is that you should invent your own programming language. Um, or to put it another way, and this is, this is the final thing I'm going to say, the value of Greek prose composition, he said, was not that it gave one any particular facility in the language that could not be gained as easily by other methods, but that if done properly, off the top of one's head, it taught one to think in Greek. One's thought patterns become different, he said, when forced into the confines of a rigid and unfamiliar tongue. Certain common ideas become inexpressible. Other previously undreamt of ones spring to life, finding miraculous new articulation. I will now take questions. Awesome. A yes, question? Oh, sorry. Do sorry. You bring you the mic. Tiffany, yep. Yeah. Uh, was this the first language that you wrote, and was your your motivation to, to write a language specifically for your niece and have it ready when she's five? Or was it really about this idea and then you were like, what language? Um, I thought for my development as a programmer, it would be good to write a language. I think everyone should write a language just for the learning experience. Um, I thought because it was my first programming language and I'm stupid, then maybe I should start easy with a programming language for children. Big mistake. It's, I think it's far harder. Um, uh, so yes. Hi. Anyone else? Uh, one question. What is the? Sorry, can you wave your? Ah, yeah. What is the next step? I mean, uh, what is the purpose for the language right now? You want to move into some schools and uh, also show it there, you know, and uh, under uh, in the elementary level, or what's the idea? Um, the idea is to, the, the whole language is completely in flux at the moment. So I've got some syntax and you can do useful stuff with it, but everything is up for debate at the moment. So I'm quite wary of showing it to too many people. Yeah, I mean, it's available on the internet at islalanguage.org, but um, I don't want to show it to too many people because it's so unfinished. But so my next step is to try it on as many people, preferably non-programmers and young children as possible, to try and tune it. Okay, we have another question way back here. Hi there. I really like your ideas, especially about kind of visual trickery and programming <laughs> environments. What do you think of Scratch? Um, is that which one's that? Is that the? I mean the Scratch uh, programming environment for kids. Sure. Um, I, I've looked at a number of languages um, uh, that are for children, and I sort of I think I said it in my in the talk that I feel like. Many of them are taking the wrong approach with starting with a GUI, because I think that's not programming. And I don't think you get the magic feeling of programming manipulating a GUI. And also, I don't think you can produce nearly as subtle constructions. So I'm trying to steer away from, from all of those approaches, essentially. Any other questions? Uh, yes. There's a couple here. OK, sorry. I only how how long have we got? I, sorry, I have can no I idea what the time is. Can we start? Uh, yeah, we're doing OK for time. Um, so this is obviously in English. I mean, it might be one of the most common languages, but do you think it should be in the in the native language of the children? I mean, it's more difficult for a German child to understand the English language. Definitely. Um, so the my idea is for this is that the keywords can be translated into other spoken languages trivially, obviously, but 
the word ordering of different languages different. But nonetheless, I, because there's only one way to do everything, then I feel like the syntax won't be a problem there. And so you could just change the word ordering of each type of statement you can make and change the keywords, and you'd have Isla in German or um, any other language you choose. What are, you, what, are, what are you the ideas to bring the more complex uh, constructs of the uh, JavaScript or whatever programming language to children? For example, think about recursions or loops or whatever. I mean, is an imperative language uh, the right way to uh, teach uh, that to children? Or do we have to think more about uh, functional uh, stuff? What are you, your ideas about that? Um, my idea is that at the moment, Isla is purely a data definition language. So there's no control statements, there's no conditionals. Um, and I'm trying to start with that core and then build up adding things as I figure out how to do them in what I hope is an intuitive way. So my ideas are a complete model on the things that you've suggested at the moment. Um, so you, you talk about how eventually you want to teach it to, or you want to be teaching programming to five-year-olds. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like one of the, the biggest hurdles at, at that age and teaching them with this rather than with a, uh, a GUI is just going to be like reading. Like at, at, at five, a lot of kids can't read that well and can't write that well. Um, what, like, what are your thoughts on that? Definitely. Um, so I feel like if children are learning to read at that age, then they could learn to program in tandem with it. And so I hope that their programming ability would be able to increase with their reading and writing ability. Um, I haven't actually tried it with any five-year-olds yet because it's not nearly good enough for that yet. Um, so don't know yet. Uh, so you mentioned that you would like to like <coughs> write language that is similar to natural language, but not quite. Uh, because it might be dangerous to actually make it feel like natural language. So where do you actually find the balance? Where, what's the kind of dividing point? Where do you decide that's kind of the way it should be? Um, the, the, the rule I've taken is that there's only one way to do everything. So there's only one way to construct every piece of syntax, which I think hopefully is enough to give the impression that you can't um, type whatever you want, but still totally under the, I don't know whether I've made the correct assumption there yet. But that's my sort of dividing line um, that I hope will keep it from going into Apple script territory, where, which is just a mess. Uh, I have a question. Um, you said that there's only one way to write syntactically correct programs. Isn't that uh, curbing the imagination of children? Or what's your take on that? Um, sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, so uh, I thought you said that there's only one way to write a correct syntax for your programming language. Isn't that curbing the imagination of children? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I think quite an obvi uh, obvious question. Why did you choose JavaScript to implement this language? Uh, actually, a bit of a confession. The original compiler is written in Clojure. Um, I uh, ported it to JavaScript so that uh, I could submit it for a talk to <laughs> JSConf. <laughs> <laughs>